The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast do not necessarily reflect or represent the views and opinions of WBGR Network. Good morning, you guys. Welcome to another lovely Wednesday here on Ed Get It Got It Good. We're at WBGR Health and Wellness Channel for you guys who don't know. For you guys on Facebook, um, we're also gonna going live from. Let's see, Naja Carter. Where are we live from, Billy? We're gonna be live from my Facebook page. Cool Beans, which is Billy Live. I'm assuming. Yep. Yep. Facebook.com okay. <laughs> Billy Live. <coughs> um. So. If you guys don't know who this man is sitting next to me, I'm going to come back and let him explain it right after this little video that we put together, or that I should say that you put together, because <laughs> I stole it from him. All right, so we'll be right back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, seven. Yo, what up, what up? Uh, let the shit drop. Uh. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. L.O.S. J. Cam, what up? Uh, too nice. Look, uh, uh. I still see your face when my eyes close Like bird box running around with a blindfold With every nothing left to do but go grind mode I move fast when the time slow Cause I know that I'ma make it happen It ain't about the rapping Just the simple satisfaction of relaxing Cause I done lost it all and got it back So when I'm off track I like to reminisce so I don't fade to black I did my last show with four dollars in my pocket And still rocked it My journey, you gotta watch it It's really wild They wasn't feeling me then Might not Welcome back, you guys. So, with that intro, Billy, thanks for being on the show with us today. Thank you for having me. Now, I would touch, like, normal hugs and everything else, but I'm a little bit infested, so <laughs> I'm going to leave that alone, because you got work to do. I do. I do. So, I see stuff in front of you. Mm -hmm. What is that? Well, today I brought a copy of my, um, my documentary that we put together. It's an album and a documentary package. Oh, cool. And we, um, we sold these for $20 a piece. Give me this. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I, so I, did, um, this. I did a bunch of like uh, uh, pop-up shops and things like that to kind of sell them. And um, then not, not too long ago, I put out another one, which is called Seven. This is an EP. They're both yours. Oh, thank you. I love stuff. <laughs> in, 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 in the time where everybody says, um, you know, no one listens to CDs and no one buys stuff anymore. <coughs> when it comes to uh, merchandising and actually like trying to make money off of your product is always good to have physical copies because while you're out of town, while you're moving around, people are, are buying it to like the music. So I've been constantly selling them all the time. So last week we had a wild bunch mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> on the show. We had um, B and A Ricky, we had um, Phantom, um, Baltimore artists. We had Bilal, and mm -hmm. we were talking about the climate in Baltimore as far as artists. Mm -hmm. Now <laughs> they said Baltimore has this me 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 mentality and don't really help each other get up or get on what do you think about that i disagree okay i, I think um because well to put myself in a certain position um we do primary like 70 percent of all the underground hip-hop uh -huh. in baltimore and we work with everybody that wants 
to work with us, and we help a lot of people out. We work with just about every single venue. So to say that people don't try to help people is not true. I think people just don't work with the right people. Okay. So yeah, I, I, I disagree with that. We have unity. Um, I deal with probably like over 100 different artists, and every single one of them will tell you the same thing. Um, we help them uh, We help them go on tours. We help them get a chance to open up for major artists at like Baltimore Soundstage, Out of Bar, Ramsey. So pretty much like everything that artists strive to be a part of is what we help artists do, but not everybody comes over to our side to work with us. Yeah. So they just need a little bit more, um, they need a little bit more information that the scene is actually a lot bigger than what they see in front of their face. So then if that's the case, how did you even get started? Well, I got started as, I started out as, um, uh, I started doing shows at a local ag center in Westminster, uh-huh. like ag- agricultural center, like a little, um, Community center, I guess. Whatever. Okay. And we were hand- we made our own flyers, but you know we didn't have no printers or nothing like that, so the flyers were like paper size. We would fold them up, put them on cars, and um. You gotta was, do what you gotta do. Yeah, you I guys. Started, just started throwing events. Um, we bought our own speakers and microphones. This is living in Carroll County. Um, we had no connections there, no DJs. I didn't know anything about clubs. I didn't know anything about anything. So we started doing it like that, and was bringing out hundreds and two hundred people to events, and um. A studio I was recording at, there was a sound engineer, his name was Matt Bittman, who actually went on to be like, he like did sound for the president, like he's like really legit. Mm-hmm. And um, he got me a job handing out flyers for a club called Sonar in Baltimore, right? So since I had like a, a, a lot of people with me, they paid me like $700 to go to Afram and Artscape and just hand out flyers. Mm-hmm. I took the money, <coughs> it was cool. Um, they gave me another job to do the same thing at um, Pimlico for a different event, and um, putting up posters and stuff. They gave me eight hundred dollars to do that, and I, I did that for a while, like like handing out flyers and pretty much being like an errand boy in a mm-hmm. sense. And then I, I approached them and said, "Hey, I, I would love to have my own show. How do I go about doing that?" And um, the guy gave me an opportunity to have my own show. We put it together, still not really knowing what I'm doing, but we packed it, and um, I think I think I walked away with like almost a thousand dollars that night and ever since then i was just like yeah this is yeah this is, it. this is it <laughs> this is so what you do. you fall into the path you're supposed to take just by keep moving forward so mm-hmm. you got an opportunity to make some cash handing out somebody else's flyers mm-hmm. and then the the lesson is use your connections that you've already got so then you went to them and said okay i want to be able to do this myself mm-hmm. you put on a show and then now you decided, okay, so I'm going to start pro- uh, promoting my own shows. And so then how did you get hooked up? Because a lot of people say, well, how do I get hooked up to actually put on my own show? First of all, you got to come out your pocket, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> there is no, you know, free way to go. So how did you get hooked up with the different locations like and stuff? stuff? Yeah. Well, kind of going back to what you said, like mm-hmm. what I what I did is a lot. what a lot of artists don't do. A lot of artists have like this entitlement thing where it's like, hey, I rap, look at me, do, 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 do. They, they think they can just be a good artist and just go straight to the major venues, go straight to the top. Through my readings and studies, I learned that it's better to offer myself to people instead of asking me, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? So I came in with that mentality. So all the different venues that I, I work with now, I did promotional work for free for all of them. I handed out flyers, I did everything they needed me to do and eventually, over the years, um, it went from me doing their promo work to them contacting me to do my own show. stuff there. Yeah. Now, once you actually get to the point of doing your own shows, you can get there, but can you bring the people? You know what I'm saying? So that's where it comes. You you having a fan base is important. You can't just be uh, a rapper. You think <coughs> you think you're great, but you can't bring too many people to an event. Two people ain't gonna cut it when you're doing a major venue. Mm-hmm. You gotta bring like 50. 100 you know the the venues need like at least two three hundred people in there for it to even make sense so um it's a lot too it's a lot to being a promoter being a promoter and being an artist are two different things Mm -hmm. so as an artist if you're trying to get on show you want to link with the promoter Mm -hmm. as a promoter it's a little different you you want to you as a promoter you want to link with a venue and then be connected to a bunch of different artists but as an artist trying to get on the shows you need to be linked to a good promoter or a booking agent and you do the both for yourself I do both for myself, yeah. And so you said a few things that I actually like. First of mm-hmm. all, you said something about reading. <laughs> yes. You guys, 
read. Just because you're out of school or whatever, do not mean you never have to pick up another book. And it's unfortunate that so many people stop reading. You don't have to read about history if that's not your thing or science if that's not your thing. But you definitely got to read about your craft. If you um, are going into the business field, you got to know about money and how it works, how promotions work, right? So with that being said, and you have the these two these two caps on your artist cap and your promoter cap mm -hmm. so you also said something about fan base <coughs> now how did you work that up how did you do the marketing to start um, getting people to follow you well we come from that's we were just pop just being popular I guess you know what I'm saying it's kind of it's kind of starts it comes it starts from your hometown yeah if you don't have people that support you in your hometown the chances of you going somewhere else and getting that same support is nearly impossible. It can happen, but you gotta kind of grow your fan base organically. Mm -hmm. So um, when we started doing music, before we even like started going to venues and stuff, you know, we were having like I would have parties at my house, mm -hmm. and we'd bring like 20, 30 people there, or whatever. That 20, 30 people, because the parties were cool, because I was a good person, grew to fifty to sixty, mm -hmm. and um, I pretty much what I did was I created like a. Um, a crew or more like an organization which is called Wisdom Court. It has several different names, whatever, and I, I made them all a part of this thing. You know what I'm saying? All part. All, they, they felt like they was a part of something. Like mm -hmm. it wasn't just like I'm just gonna support him just so he can benefit off it. Now, like I, I made these per people DJs, these people did security, these people did this, these, and I just kind of like took my surroundings and gave them all jobs, and it just kind of grew and blossomed. Mm -hmm. Now, you gave him a family. Well, like, um, <laughs> yeah. Definitely a family. If you would ask any of our crew, they would say, if you say one name, one thing about us, they would say family. But it's probably about 75 of us right now, mm -hmm. um, spread out through about six different states. Yeah, it's not, we're not a gang at all. We just move and, um, you know, we have certain rules and certain things that we do, things that we don't do. And uh, I just kind of go to different areas and find other crews that are doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And because I have like different kind of connections, I kind of bring them into our, our fold. To make our crew just get grow bigger, bigger and it and it develops strength. There's strength in numbers, exactly. you guys. Yeah. So how did you expand from <coughs> locally to now different states, different cities, and and mm -hmm. opening up for like you have a Bone Thugs and Harmony show coming up, right? Yeah. January third, you guys. All right, so that's a two part question. Mm -hmm. So um, the first thing was I met through. This is funny because it all goes back to how I started, but through me getting that job from handing out the promotional stuff. At Club Sonar, I met this this guy named um, they were uh, a group called Homicidal Maniacs. They were some uh, there were some white cats from um, West Virginia. Homicidal <laughs> Maniacs. Yeah, and then uh, they had a <laughs> they had a crew with them, whatever, and um, a crew called Dread Eye. And over time, we would like I'd bring them to Baltimore. They bring me to West Virginia. So then I met another group of guys that was in Pennsylvania called um, All Day Audio, and I would bring them to Baltimore. They would bring me to Pennsylvania. So I started putting two of these together. I'm like, you know what? I could probably start doing shows and just taking some people from Baltimore and bring them with me to whatever. And that, it took me like two years to realize I was actually putting together tours, but not knowing mm -hmm. I was putting together tours. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, I was signed to a, a booking agency, and I would always ask them, like, what do I need to do to go on tours? And they, you know, they would give me pointers on how to do things. And pretty much I took what I was already doing, the pointers that the booking agency gave me. Um, I started going on YouTube. I started studying how to put together tours, how to promote yourself, how to talk to venues, um, how to captivate audience in different markets. Self-study. And I took everything that I learned, and I said, you know what, I'm going to do it myself. So I started putting together tours. At first it was like Baltimore, Maryland-based mm -hmm. tours, and then like it went from that to New York, D.C., Virginia, um, Connecticut. I, I've been up and down the East Coast, Ohio. Um, right, we're in the process of we're on a tour right now that I put together, not for myself, but for my other artists that I manage. And um, that's pretty much how I did it. Just it's like a piece by piece thing. But I've been doing this for like a long time. Long time. Yeah. So okay, so you put together tours, mm -hmm. and and what does that look like? Because that sounds like a lot of work. It was it was originally, and then I, I put I put together a structure to where like um, the first thing I do is I find <coughs> the, the headliners for the tour. So I have like maybe like three headliners for the tour, and then what I do is I find three. Um, I guess you would call them undercard headliners. Mm -hmm. So say say me and you were the headliners of the tour, so I'll find three other people to be underneath the list. So that five would be the main push for the tour. So I'll go to different states, and in each state I contact the promoters and the venues, and I find out 
who's popular, who brings a crowd in each state, mm-hmm. I contact them, I put them on that show for that particular For that stop. area, yeah. Yeah, and I do that at seven, eight, 12 different stops all up and down the East Coast or wherever. And um, I, I started doing it so much and now it's like second nature. Like I can, I can put one together tomorrow. So anything that you do on a repetitive basis mm-hmm. will get you good at it. So a lot of people get frustrated. A lot of people don't want to work for free. <laughs> you know, even when, when I have actresses and entertainers mm-hmm. on here, they've taken shows for free or they've done photo shoots for free or they it's just a connection thing and growing that network. And it's funny that one of the things that you did for free or from the very beginning comes full circle and helps you get to the next level. So never knock somebody asking you to do something that's going to get you in the area Mm -hmm. or in the industry that you need to learn from. So doing stuff for free can actually give you the knowledge that you need to get to the next level. So stop hating. Mm -hmm. Free. That's I I love. I love this topic because Free and investing. Um, one thing that blocks a lot of artists, uh, you know, when you're trying, this is going to lead into the other part of that question you mm-hmm. asked earlier about the bone thugs and stuff. Um, <coughs> yep. A lot of artists don't want to sell tickets. You know, they'll be like, I don't, I'm too good to sell tickets, whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. In order to open up for like a bone thugs, a Fillmore, a Rancid, any of those things, you're going to have to sell tickets. And they want 50 to 100 ticket sales for you to even be considered to do those shows. So the artists that get frustrated, they refuse to sell tickets for small shows. They refuse to be on small stages, not recognizing that these small stages are stepping stones in order to get you to a bigger stage. Mm-hmm. So what I did was I did like a thousand holes in the walls where I performed for five people. I performed for 10 people. And I went from that to perform for a thousand to two thousand. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So um, through that and learning and networking and everything like that, I'm able to sell the 50s and the 100 tickets. So when these venues need opening acts, we'll probably up in the top five that open up the majority of the DMV open and that mm-hmm. stops and like all the major venues you know Soundstage Fillmore Ramsey they're all like notable yeah let's call yeah. them <laughs> yeah right <laughs> the notable venues and you're not you can't you can't just walk in there it's impossible so how did you get that mindset because mm, if everybody around you is thinking one way mm-hmm. how did you actually go against the grade I've always been I've always been uh, I guess a leader even when I was kind of coming up and I was under people I always had a vision of what I wanted to do and one thing that I did like I have a vision about certain things I want to do and I don't let anything kind of take me off of it mm-hmm. um, almost insanity in the sense of like you know doing the same thing over and over again it's like a sanity mm-hmm. like that it can work it could be the sanity or it could be um, um, discipline or, or, or dedication I like to look at it as discipline mm-hmm. um, and I just I don't know I just found out what I wanted to do and, and I never let anybody tell me I couldn't do it um, my inspiration comes from people telling me that I couldn't do things. You use that as your motivation. Yeah, they were like, um, uh, "You're from you're from the county. No one's gonna pay attention to you rapping." Like when I got into the Baltimore scene, they because uh, I wasn't from there, I didn't know anybody. You know, we got a lot of people turning nose up to us. Um, over time, we're packing venues and no one knows who we are. They're like, "Yo, who are these people?" Like, there's something up with these people. So mm-hmm. now today, you wouldn't even, you would think I was from there. Like, mm-hmm. and when I go to West Virginia, PA, uh, New York, whatever, the way that people embrace us the different crews and embraces you would think I was from those areas too. So I kind of like, I kind of threw it all the negative um, energy that people thought about me and I threw it back in their faces. Mm-hmm. And um, that was just my best way to kind of, I didn't have to cuss at nobody. I didn't have no social media beef, I, nothing. I was, I'll just show you. Yeah. I'll show you that I can do whatever I want to do. I'll put my mind to it. Yeah. 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 See, so if there's advice or anything that you would give up and coming artists, what would it be? I mean, um, there's a lot of things, but, uh, <laughs> uh the first thing I would do as an up-and-coming artist, I would um, perfect your stage show. Um, performing is, nowadays, performing is like, performing and merchandise is like the only two ways that you're really gonna be able to make any money. And I thought the goal of getting into this game was to make money, mm-hmm. but a lot of people get into the game just so they can look cool on YouTube. You can't make any money there, so you end up wasting five, 10 years of your life, you turn around and you have nothing to show, to show for it. For it. Mm-hmm. So if the goal is to make money, you want to do things to make money. So you want to learn how to grow a fan base because the only way you can make money for music is if people like you, which is a fan base. If people don't like you, if people don't follow you, then you're not going to make any kind of money. So it's very, very important to focus on growing a fan base. Um, and you can grow a fan base from performing at shows and having a good stage show, handing out flyers, putting CDs out, networking with people and things like that. So um, a- attitude and networking is extremely important and you can network your way you can network your way into a 
a great position. That's what I do. Networking. I'm always preaching networking <coughs> on here about building those bridges, those relationships. You know, everybody has something and you can barter, <laughs> right? Hey, I have this, you have that, let's work together, build it up to a bigger to a bigger thing. You need a good point you led into was um everyone has something. Uh you need to become valuable in whatever it is that you do. Mm -hmm. So the reason why I'm able to so many things come across my table is because I made myself valuable. Not only am I an artist that can bring numbers out when I perform, so a lot of promoters will pay me or pretty much give me any show I want because of that fact, but I'm also a promoter, so I know how to promote myself and the venue. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm a manager and a booking agent, so I can also bring 